Thank you. Um, so just before starting, since this is really the last talk, I wanted to start by thanking uh, Nick. I don't know where he is. Where's Nick? Oh, there's Nick. And Paul, who I know is outside uh, for this uh, wonderful conference. OK, uh, so I will talk about uh, yeah, family floor homology and mirror symmetry. So let me, talk, let me begin by basically stating uh, the results that I'm not going to prove, but that I'm explain something about. So, so you take uh, x omega, and you assume that this is a closed uh, symplectic manifold. Um, and I want to assume that this is equipped with some Lagrangian torus vibration. And in this talk, what that means is that there are no singularities. No singularities. I'll say something a little bit about examples in a moment. but and. Uh, I want to have one technical condition, and I'm just going to state it for, for honesty's sake. So I'm going to assume that uh, pi 2 of q is 0. Um, and I say this, in addition, I want to say I don't know a single example of a closed symplectic manifold with uh, Lagrangian torus vibration that doesn't satisfy this. But it's, a it's a, actually an open problem, whether one can prove that this is always the case. OK, and then under this assumption, what I want to do is I want to say that there exists an analytic space which I will call y. That's basically the mirror. And this analytic space has um, a class, let's call it beta, in H2 analytic of uh, y with coefficients in O star. OK, so if you don't know what that is, just ignore it, some kind of twisting, such that uh, we have a fully faithful embedding. Embedding from the chi category of x into the beta twisted derived category of coherent sheaves on y. Okay. So this is this. Is, I don't I don't know um, because I just construct it. Um, but I think one thing, the reason I don't, want to, I don't really want to know is because people usually think about, that, about this in the algebraic setting, okay? And I'm going to be talking about some kind of analytic spaces. So there's a big difference. That's why here I was insistent on writing H2 analytic. It may not be what you think of usually broader crosses. Okay, so if you just, um, so yeah, so what's, what's some, kind of, some kind of history? For this result, so the construction, the construction of Y is basically due to uh, Fukaya, and in some sense, he also constructed and constructed what I think of some kind of local the local part of this functor. So this says somehow you take something on x and from Lagrangian in x and you obtain the coherent chief. So that particular means that if you have some kind of chart which is sufficiently small, then you should get a module over the ring of functions, a complex of, complex of modules over the ring of functions. And that's, and that's what I call the local picture and the local plus, so plus the local construction. So a few years, a couple of years ago, 14. So I proved, uh, so basically I proved that, um, so I constructed the A infinity functor, functor plus uh, a proof uh, that, the, that it is faithful. Uh, 
And so today it's really about, about the kind of the fact fully part is what it's all about. Um, and unfortunately, it really is much harder than the proof that, that the thing is faithful. OK, so that's the, that's the context. So, so next, I want to <coughs> say something about some kind of what kind of uh, examples. Those are just remarks, maybe. So um, maybe the, the first remark is that you know you really cannot, in general, uh, we must work in the analytic category. And the reason simply is that there is an example due to Thurston, and which I analyzed with uh, Denis and Ludmill. of um, a symplectic four manifold with uh, B1 equals 3. Turns out, so this is actually Thurston wrote this paper to point out this example of this symplectic four manifold, which cannot be Kähler. But it actually has a, so what I'm saying here is that we analyze, so the, it, with the Lagrangian torus vibration, and when you feed it into this machine, the mirror uh, is, um, is uh, an analytic space. which is, in fact, the elliptic vibration um, over the elliptic curve with no section. And in fact, it's a ex class of examples that was studied by Kadaira. And he proved that these are not, they, they, they certainly are not projective. So somehow it's not. So the incoherent achieves or force you to kind of do something, something analytic. So that's the first comment I have to make. So the, the second comment um, that I wanted to make is that, you know, m some of you may or may not be familiar with somehow the Novikov ring, but uh, maybe Ken, um, um, Nick said something about that in his talk, but we have to do analytic topology. We have to, uh, analytic geometry, we have to study um, analytic spaces over this Novikov ring lambda, the Novikov field lambda. So I'll just remind you, so this is, so you just fix some base, so this is some kind of base field. In this talk, it's really not relevant what it is. Um, if you, in the more general things you want to do the but then you, at some point, maybe you want to assume at least it has characteristic zero, but I, nothing that I will do requires that. Um, and that's partly because it's because I assume this pi two of q equals zero. That's at least one, one thing that allows me to, to work with that arbitrary field. So anyway, so if you, if you fix a field, then you can look at series. So basically uh, some kind of uh, Laurent series in one variable. So the coefficients are in my ground field, and the lambda i's, well, you know, you maybe want to imagine that they're integers, but unfortunately, that's not what you have to do. You can, instead, you have to work with real numbers, and you assume that limit as i goes to infinity of lambda i equals plus infinity. And so the fact that you, that, you know, you have this kind of growth of the lambda i's means that if you multiply two of these series, then again, it makes sense. Some kind of infinite series. So what do I mean we have to study analytic spaces over y? Well, fortunately, 
You don't have to invent, reinvent the wheel. So, so now I will say, so I will unfortunately have to talk about, up, oh, yep. Yes? So unfortunately, the only examples that I know are quotients of R2n by some kind of nilpotent group, nilpotent, like some kind of Heisenberg group, something like that. But you could do something a little bit more complicated. You can have some kind of crystallographic, like add some kind of finite part to that. But that's somehow the most natural class to look at, and that's what gives rise to this uh, Thurston manifold, like Heisenberg group. Um, okay, so what do I mean we want to do analytic geometry over this field? So that field is equipped with evaluation. Lambda star. Lambda star is the non-zero element to R. And this valuation, it just takes sum of ai t to the lambda i to lambda zero, where this is well, let me just write it formally. It's the minimum over ai not zero of lambda i. But the way I normally think about it is that I take this thing, I write it as t to the lambda zero, a zero plus t to the lambda zero plus higher order. And then I extract lambda zero. OK, so what is the, how to think of this valuation? Well, you think of this valuation by kind of imagining that we replace you know, that uh, lambda is analogous to the complex numbers. And on the complex numbers, you know, if I take C star inside here, I can write everything as e to the rho i plus, uh, e to the rho plus i theta. Okay, and then I can map this to R by just assigning rho to this. So this is z goes to the log of the absolute value of z. That's roughly what I did. So this rho i is the valuation. So if I, I could, of course, rewrite, so I'm talking in terms of valuation. This data, this valuation is equivalent to the data of this norm, OK? So what is, what is complex analytic geometry? You know, maybe it is somehow you study things over the complex numbers, but with some kind of keeping track of growth properties with respect to the norm. So you, everything is going to have some kind of power series expansion. But then you, may, you want to make sure that that power series expansion actually converges in a certain domain. That's what it means to have an analytic function in that domain. So you just set up everything exactly the same way over the Novikov field. Fortunately, uh, for this talk, we only need some very special kinds of domains. So we will consider special kind of domain, which is, in fact, contained in lambda star to the n. Okay. So lambda star to the n uh, is like the analog of the complex torus, c star to the n. It has a valuation map where I take the valuation of each coordinate. It maps into Rn. Okay. If I take, and now what I want to do is I want to consider domains which are defined by inequalities on the valuation, on their valuation. Okay. So specifically, what I want to do is I want to take some kind of, so what, what's a function on lambda star to the n? A function on lambda star to the n is like a Laurent monomial. So take a Laurent monomial. Let's say z to the alpha, where alpha is in z to the n. Okay? And I want to require a condition of the form the valuation of z to the alpha is greater than or equal to some number lambda. Okay? That's the kind of equations we want to impose. And we want to impose enough such equations that what we get in Rn is, in fact, a polytope. <coughs> Find by equations on the evaluation. Um, you know, so that you get a poly so that you get a closed region on Rn. So to obtain closed subset. 
closed polytope. Compact polytope. Okay. So I will, so you, have, you get to some compact polytope P in Rn defined by think, equations of this form. And, um, and then you take the inverse image of lambda star to the n, all the things with the given valuation, and that's the kind of domain we want. Okay, so let me just say, you know, I explained basically what happened. You just, you, you take Laurent monomials, you impose equations on Laurent monomials, you'd like enough of them to get a polytope, but you could also think about this backwards, which means that um, you know, I, this Rn that we start with, it actually has a lattice. It's equipped with the standard Standard lattice, Zn. Okay, so it makes sense to define an integral affine polytope to be a polytope P in Rn, which is defined by equations, by equations of the form pairing of u with alpha greater than or equal to lambda, where lambda is real and alpha is in Zn. Okay. I'll get maybe you know if I were being a little bit more formal, I would say m, and then there, there's a lattice, and then you tensor it with r to get some blah blah blah. But so then I would have maybe this would be in the dual space. But this equation in Rn is exactly this equation in lambda star. They, they correspond to each other. And so the ring of analytic functions analytic functions on uh, Yp, okay? So I need some notation for that. So let's call that the ring gamma p of analytic functions is going to be consists of all Laurent series sum uh, of c, uh, c alpha z to the alpha. Okay, alpha is in Zn. C alpha is in um, uh, C alpha is um, is in uh, or, or, or lambda, and then you want to assume that F converges in in y in y p. But this condition, this condition of convergence, is exactly the same. is exactly the same as saying that if I substitute f and I evaluate it at a point in y, I, it basically means that the limit as um, norm of alpha goes to infinity of the valuation um, of c alpha y to the alpha okay, equals plus infinity for all alpha. Uh, for all uh, for all y in um, my domain, for all y in y p. Okay, so it's a condition on the valuation. It says that they grow sufficiently fast. So example, there are the two examples I want to point out. There's like the example number zero. Example zero is uh, you just work n equals zero, n equals one. Sorry. Uh, and then I want to take somehow some kind of degenerate polytope. I want to set p to be just a point. So p equals the point zero. Okay. And then um, that says I should, take, I should take a series such that this converges in yp. But what does it mean to be over zero? So y lies in yp if and only if y zero. Uh, if and only if um, the valuation of y equals zero. Okay. That's, what, that's the definition. So then if I look at this expression, valuation of c to the alpha 
y to the alpha, this is actually equal to the valuation of c to the alpha, okay? Because this contributes nothing to it. This contributes nothing to it. So that implies that gamma zero is just Laurent series whose coefficients go to, in, whose, so the valuation of whose coefficients go to infinity. That's all. And equal to. Sorry? Oh, you can't see gamma zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a, an obstruction. Uh, okay, so gamma zero is given by the condition that the valuation of c to the alpha goes to infinity. Okay. So uh, I want to give. Let me give one more example. I want to give one more example. Example one. Oh. Okay, we have to play this game again. Uh, example one, where I just want to take a, an interval of non-zero width, just to give some idea. So uh, p equals the interval from minus 1 to 1, OK? And in that case, all I will say is that the condition is that um, the, the, so get that the limit as alpha goes to infinity of the valuation of c alpha, OK, minus um, the absolute value of alpha goes to plus infinity. So what this does basically is that it tells you not only must the valuations go to infinity, but they must go sufficiently fast that if you were to multiply them by this z to the alpha, the thing still goes to infinity. So this is kind of the kind of condition that you get. Okay. So um, so the the so Tate followed by others developed. Uh, a theory of rigid analytic spaces spaces over fields with non archimedean valuations where these are the local models in fact their local models are more general than this but these are the only ones we'll use today such local So if you, you know, if this is the only thing you know, and the only thing you know is that somehow mirror symmetry should tell you you have a rigid analytic space, then you have some idea that maybe, maybe this is some framework you should use. But still, it's confusing because there is the puzzle of where, so where, oh, well, anyway, uh, do the, such rings appear? in symplectic topology. Okay. And the end, I, I, I claim that this is some kind of, there's a natural uh, place for such rings, which I will explain now. So, so let's say that we're not even in this context of a Lagrangian torus vibration, just have some M, which is symplectic. And you have L inside M which is Lagrangian. And just so that I don't have to think, I'm going to just, um, well, no, maybe I'll, maybe I'll keep going. So, <clears throat> that's not the point of this. So, you probably may have heard that L does not actually define an object of the Foucault category. You have to make some choice. And the most natural choice that you would make if you assume, for example, that symplectic and has C1 equals 0, and if you assume that L is, has Maslow 0, okay? If you make these two assumptions, then the most natural thing to do is to say that L together with a choice of rank 1 local system gives you an object of the Foucault category, even though it may or may not be obstructed. Object of f of x. And I just, here I'm going to say, may be obstructed. Okay. 
So what we want to do is to figure out, is to somehow understand all of these objects at once. Okay. So what is a, what is a oh, choice of rank unitary, rank one local system, so unitary. Okay, so what's a rank one local system? A rank one local system is a representation of pi one of L, which is exactly, which is the same thing as a module over the group ring. I'm going to put lambda because we're working with lambda coefficients. Okay. But then you could ask, what does it mean for this representation to be unitary? So being unitary, mm, let me, before explaining that. So let's assume now that L is a torus, just so that we can see the analogy. So if L is a torus, this is exactly Laurent polynomials. Now, the condition of uni being unitary says that the norm is 1, and in this language, is nor that means that the valuation is 1. So a unitary representation corresponds to a rank 1 module over the completion of this group ring. Obtained by allowing, obtained by, uh, we look all series of the form C to the alpha times G, okay? C to the G times G, where the, uh, the valuation of CG goes to plus infinity. So that's, that's, that's where this completion shows up. And if you apply it in the case of a torus, so for a torus, uh, you get exactly this kind of trivial example zero that I did over there. You get, uh, what did I call it? You did basically this gamma of zero from earlier. So if you, are at this point, then you, so what you can do is you now, you, now, you now have some kind of understanding of how to put all the unitary representations together, uh, but I already tried to, I kind of simplified my life by just talking about, about pi one, okay? When we do Fukai categories, we know that somehow we should work at the, the derived level, and the, the derived replacement of pi one is the chains on the base loop space, and so what you get is this kind of theorem, which has been, sort of, you know, <coughs> I don't know if to say, like, in preparation, will eventually come out. I don't know. Anyway, you know, for the future, will eventually appear. Uh, which is that, you know, if in th there exists an enlargement of the Fukai category of X. So let's do Fukai category inside this kind of completed Fukai category. And the objects here, objects are um, modules over, well, here I said kind of completion of the group ring, but it's better to say objects are kind of pair L together with some kind of module over um, the, over some completion of the homology of the base loop space. So this is somehow, that's the, that's a place where these kind of rings of analytic functions appear naturally, but the thing that is most natural 
from the point of view of symplectic topology in the sense this category is somehow behaves extremely well in terms of uh, symplectic topology in the sense if you take a Lagrangian equipped with such a, with such a module and you take a Hamiltonian isotopy, then you know, there, is an, there, you know, there is essentially an equivalence associated to Hamiltonian isotopies. Okay, so what does this, what, why are we doing this here? So, what I want to consider the most straightforward thing to do so let's go back to this x over q. Okay. So what Lagrangians do we have? Well, what we have are the Lagrangian fibers, okay. which are by Arnold, well, Arnold's version of the Liouville theorem that xq is a torus. Okay, so we can extract from it this completion. So completion um, of lambda. I'm going to write it like this: of h1 of xq coefficients in z. This is somehow the thing that's most canonical. Okay, so you get this completion just where you take the valuations to infinity, and you can associate to this a space yq, okay? a rigid analytic space, which is exactly the product, is, it correspond, the points of this space are the unitary local system, or unitary <coughs> rank one on um, xq. And then what we want to do is simply define y to be the union of all of these. Now the problem is this is an infinite union and the, you know, one of the things that appears in this uh, theory of Tate of rigid analytic spaces is that you cannot somehow, you, you can take a space and cover it by finitely many of those local charts that I was using, but you're not allowed to take an infinite cover. That's not, that's not acceptable. And it makes some sense because we haven't built in any um, non-trivial relation between the, the different, um, the different Lagrangian fibers. We just said, look at one of them at a time and uh, consider the local systems on it. So what are you supposed to do? So the key fact and this is due to Vakaya is that if we were to fix a Lagrangian L and an almost complex structure, <coughs> J. Okay. then given such a choice, we can in fact thicken our Fleur homology groups. we can define a Fleur homology group let me write it like this I'm going to write um, HF star of L with XQ okay equipped with gamma P where P is a subset of H upper one of XQ with R coefficients whenever the diameter of P is sufficiently small. Okay. 
actually, maybe just to be even more precise, is much smaller than some constant that, well, then I don't have to be much smaller. It's much smaller than some, smaller than some epsilon, which depends on L and J. Okay. So the case of P equals zero, if the diameter, if the diameter is actually zero, um, uh, uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you're actually working at, with p equals zero, then you know what I'm saying over there is that you don't have to make any choices. The Fleur homology is actually well defined. Everything is invariant. It behaves the same way that the Fleur homology always behaves in simplex topology. But if you want to take a non-zero polytope, then you have to fix an L and a J, okay? And then you have to, then you can define a Fleur homology group like this. So that suggests that what we should do is the following thing. <clears throat> so we want to define some category, which I will call A of, um, well, it's, it's actually, let me just call it A of Q for analytic. So whose object are these integral affine polytopes? Subset of Q. Which are integral affine. <laughs> So what do I mean by P uh, inside Q integral affine? I already said what it means to be integral affine inside of Rn. And what I didn't mention is that, again, this Arnold theorem, Arnold gives an identification, a local identification, identification of Q with H upper one of X Q with coefficients in R. In fact, maybe this isn't even Arnold, this is just flux. Flux map um, uh, near uh, Q. So you take a point in, you take a point in this base. And you take a point Q prime. And I basically what by, so this, these two are Lagrangian, so this path between them, which is locally canonically defined, has a well-defined flux. And that flux is an element in H1. So now you have modeled your space after a vector space, and this thing has a lattice, which is, which is first cohomology with Z coefficients. So it makes sense to talk about integral affine polytopes. So, um, <laughs> Great, so we want to build this, this category with such objects. And right now I'm going to be vague about uh, what the morphisms are, except that I will say such that um, morphisms, let me just do this, A of P, P prime, this is morphisms, equals gamma, of P prime if P prime is contained in P. Okay. So we have these rings of functions associated to each such polytope by this, or what is explain, I was explaining over there. And then you'd like to make sure that if you take a big polytope and harm with a small polytope, then you get P, P prime, then you get the ring of functions on the smaller thing. And now, given L, The first thing you want to do is you want to assign a module over this category A. And this, unfortunately, is not in general possible, or at least not in general directly possible. But there's a trick, and the trick um, is well, I was about to say the trick is due to Tate, but I don't think he would appreciate that. 
uh, the trick uses an argument of Tate. So Tate proved that these ring of functions um, are are uh, form are acyclic. That if you that the that the check complexes of these rings of functions are acyclic. Check complexes of rings of functions are acyclic. When you translate translate this in this language, cyclic. What that implies is that if you consider A epsilon, which is the category of polytopes of diameter less than epsilon, okay, that this category of polytopes of diameter less than epsilon, this category generates A. So I haven't defined the morphisms. I've just said some kind of key property. I don't. Well, maybe at the end I will say something. But whatever it is, whichever way you define this, this is something you want to be true. And once this is true, that means that I don't have to define a module over A. I just have to define a module over A epsilon. Okay? And this is something that can't, you know, I haven't quite explained how to do this because, but over there I already said I can at least define the Fleur homology of L with any polytope of sufficiently small epsilon. So to construct this, you basically extend uh, this previous idea of defining Fleur homology, and you make it compatible with operations. So by making the above construction compatible with operations. OK. So now maybe I can at least say why this is something you want to assume. So let's see what would come out if you have at least defined this, this category this way. <clears throat> so having done this, we get You get a gamma p. In fact, everything is an A infinity module, but I'm just a gamma p uh, 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 a complex of gamma p. Oh, the p goes up for some reason. Modules for each p and q. Okay. So that's the that's just the data you. So that's what a module is. So you have so you assign for each element of P some vector space, and then the morphism uh, object of this category some vector space, and then the morphism and the morphism that object should act. And two, if I take P prime contained in P, okay, then we should have a map. So what, what so what you have is always is a map like this. P P prime tensor. The value of this module, okay, it needs a name, I'm sorry. The module is called module curly L of L. I mean, there will be no other Lagrangian, so just one. Curly L. Uh, tensor L of uh, P to L of P prime. Okay? But over here, I said we should assume, we should make sure that when you take these rings of functions, you get that. So this is just gamma of p prime. Okay. And if you work through, okay, one of the things you can prove is that this is in fact an equivalence. So you just prove that this is an equivalence. No, sorry, let me just, I'm going too fast. What is so, so what you can prove is that this induces So this induces, so you replace that by gamma p prime. You see that this induces a map uh, gamma tensor over gamma p prime with L, um, uh, sorry, uh, gamma p prime tensor over gamma p with L of p 
to L of P prime. And then you show that this is an equivalent. So the outcome of this is that now you're on the other side. You're on the mirror side. You have this kind of yp, and you have this yp prime. Okay, and you have some complex of, you know, coherent sheaves on yp, and some complex of coherent sheaves on yp prime. And this says that the that you have a map from one, from the restriction of one to yp prime to the other, and that map is an equivalence. So then you can glue together. I mean, this is, no, no, and there's nothing to say but gluing. This is the data of a complex of coherent sheaves, except what I didn't say is that I didn't check any higher coherence. If you take a triple thing, I haven't said anything about how the compatibility, work, compatibility works out. And when you try to understand the how the, com the compatibility of uh, triple intersections, you will see that class in H2 with O star coefficients that I, that I mentioned at the beginning, this Brouwer class. You can get rid of the Brouwer class. You can get rid, so on, on, double interse on uh, triple intersections, on triple intersections, we get uh, you know, potential incompatibility. Okay. Fifteen minutes. So, so that's the that's the basic idea. Now, so the question is, how do you go from having constructed uh, this module to actually proving that we have some kind of fully faithful embedding? So I will just omit the part of having a functor. It's pretty easy to see. You know, it's, well, let me just write it. It's, it's easy to see that um, HF star of L prime L, um, just not even do that. HF star of L L acts on these groups. HF star of L with this X Q with gamma P. And this induces a map from this Fleur cohomology group to HOM over the category A. Now, in principle, I should write A epsilon everywhere. But this generation thing means that I don't have to worry about, about writing epsilon everywhere. So HOM over A from this module L to itself. Okay, And this is the functor up to some technicalities, well, which will Again, maybe mention at the end. Uh, this is essentially the, this was what was shown earlier to be faithful. So this is shown to be faithful, mm, known to be faithful. So if you're in a setup like this, you'd like to know what more do you need to show in order to establish the fact that this is um, fully faithful. So we need to make sure that that map is surjective. And now the way to do this is to not just construct the left module. So the left module is just harm from this to, to that. But now you take uh, the right module. So, cons uh, so consider the right module. R, okay, which is basically the Fleur cohomology in the other direction. So what kind of structure maps do we have? So the most basic uh, thing, uh, just the most basic thing we have, which is actually fairly simple, is that we have a map from uh, R, um, sorry, tensor, over L, tensor with L over A, to uh, this Fleur cohomology of L with itself. Okay. So how is this map constructed? This map is just is constructed as follows. So just draw a picture. 
So this is L, and this is L, and this is this fiber. Okay. So over here, I have uh, my left module. Over here, I have my right module. And over here, I have Fleur module valid itself. So on the other hand, I just said that there is uh, this map from here to here to uh, home. Sorry, this is, I'm, I'm going to run out of room. Oh, no, but I can, OK, good. Home uh, over A from L to L. So this map is uh, given by uh, something like this. So this is L. And this is now L again, and this is XQ. Great. So we are trying to show that this is surjective. So to show that this is surjective, the easiest thing would be to, well, the thing that you want to do is you want to analyze this map independently. So the claim is that there is going to be some map here to something, and then that. Okay. Then you will prove that this is an, is uh, an isomorphism on cohomology from which you will conclude that this is surjective. So what, uh, let me just pass to another board. So what more can we do? What other triangles can we consider? So the most basic, the, the, the next thing you could do is you could just say, well, um, we somehow haven't used the action of morphisms in A on L. So there is some arrow here, um, A, L, L. I'm going to write it in a slightly strange way. I'm going to write it as a tensor over L, A, um, um, from the diagonal, uh, from, sorry, from L to the diagonal. So this is basically just, you take, you take, so this factor is actually, it's two pieces. This goes like this. It's just a purely formal thing. Delta tensor over A with L. Okay? And now here you just, multiplication by the diagonal is the identity. Okay. And so it seems, so now, okay, so we have here HF star LL. It seems that the main thing to do is to build a map like this. Okay. But a map like this is really just this part. So that means we want to map R to, um, well, but actually, in fact, I'll just do it in the opposite way. We want to map um, L tensor over just the ground ring with R to delta. And we want this to be a map of bimodules. Let me draw this map. Just like I drew the other ones. So. Um, okay, so just like before, pictures, all the pictures look the same. Um, except that now this is some kind of, this is L. I haven't drawn this picture before, have I? Oh, yes. No, I haven't drawn this picture before. This is some kind of XQ, and this is maybe some XQ prime. Okay. So that's what this map should be. And, uh, and now I just want to say that this is the hardest map of all. So this is by far the hardest step. And the reason is that, you know, if Q is equal to Q prime, this is easy. Okay? But, and now if Q um, is not equal to Q prime, then this should be zero. But 
I implicitly, throughout this whole talk, I implicitly have been identifying this Lagrangian XQ with this local system, uh, let me just say, with this completion gamma p of the homology of the base loop space with XQ prime gamma p. If these p's, so here I think of the p's as corresponding, are given by the same subset of q. So this says that something is off because it looks like if you compute it one way, you just compute it in some homology group. And if you compute it the other way, you just get zero. Okay? So something, something has to resolve this, uh, this tension. And so to, to resolve this, we, you know, so, so actually one way this is resolved is, so, so to resolve this, you have to do some computations. Uh, in this category. We have to compute more morphisms morphisms in this category A. Okay? And you have to compute them you know, using, you write down some chain complexes, you know, some kind of local, some homs between local systems in Q, uh, on XQ. And what you get is that if you take um, somehow the Fleur cohomology of XQ with some local system, with some kind of this ring gamma P, and now with itself, but equipped with a different local system, with a different completion. So you take P and P prime. Okay, here's Q here. Here's P, and here's P prime. Each one of them defines for you some completion of the homology of the loop space, oh, sorry, of the, and we're not, I don't have to say that, it's just of the group ring. If you compute this, this is always zero if P is not equal to P prime. Okay. So this is the essential computation that says that you have some hope of, of life turning out okay. Because that says at least when this group is zero for a good reason, when this group is zero for a good reason, that is because the polytopes are disjoint, then the computation that you do Fleur theoretically by saying, oh, just pick the base points here and here, which tells you you should get zero, that's reasonable, is compatible with the computation that you would get if you were to help put the thing in the middle and try to compute for both of them. So you, you get that that is zero. And now I have one minute. So what I will say is that to, to resolve to actually resolve uh, the problem, you have to use Hamiltonian perturbations. So in general, to make sense of that diagram of this bottom left corner, okay, you perturb um, the diagonal by a symplectomorphism, by a Hamiltonian symplectomorphism, by Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Okay? And once you perturb it by a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, this becomes somehow not as dire a situation in the sense that, you know, if it's true that, that Q, that XQ intersects its image under this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism transversely, then that's going to be true for every, for every nearby fiber. Okay? And so instead of being stuck in a situation where something is somehow tautologically zero and the other thing is, you know, some computation of homological algebra, both of them are a computation in homological algebra you have to do. Okay, which you then can compute, and then you ch can check that, in fact, you can factor through this, through, this, um, through this bottom right thing. Okay, so I will stop here. I'll just say one word, which is once you do this, there's only one remaining step, which is to show that this map, this red map, is in fact an equivalence. So this is, and once you know that this is an equivalence, this is just 
some tautology, which is always an isomorphism, but some kind of unique dilemma, and therefore this has to be surjective. Okay, thank you. <laughs>